Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another exciting presentation on marketing. Today, we're going to take a look at marketing of the goods and services. Really, this is all about what marketing is. So let's take a look and identify what are goods versus services. So first off, we're going to take a look at the different types of goods and services. We're then going to move into the organizational structures and take a look at how companies organize themselves to better serve their customers. Again, this is a, a as, as far as a connection goes, back to the evolution of marketing concept, this is a fairly new idea as far as organizing your structures, your, your business units in a way that better serves your customers. So what are goods versus services? If you take a look at the pictures, you'll see you notice a very different ideas here in, in terms of goods versus services. If you look at the picture on the left, you see a, a number of items that many of you have shoved in your locker somewhere, uh, or if laying around the backyard or in your room or something. If you look to the right, I guarantee you can't find any of those pictures relating to your home. Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you have some sort of concierge service. Maybe you have a person answering your telephone and someone in your garage fixing your automobile. But I doubt it. So what is the difference between goods and services? Think about it. Do you have an answer? Perfect. Goods really are those idea those things, those items that are tangible, that you can hold, that you can touch, that you can use. Services... Well, I don't think any of these people would like you to touch them. That would be kind of weird. Services are not those things that you can touch, use. Actually, you can use. Uh, services are, are, are those people who perform some sort of function for you. If you look at the top left picture under services, you'll notice a guy holding some wine and so, or some champagne, offering room service. You'll notice a postal carrier delivering your mail, an automobile mechanic fixing your car. Uh, as you drive through the drive through window at your local McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, whatever it may be, someone handing you your food. If you look at the bottom, you'll see paramedics and firemen offering service to the someone injured. And lastly, you'll see someone answering telephones, um, working at a call center. These are all services, goods, those are the items like the Xbox controller, soccer ball, the Converse running shoe, the books, your iPhone or phone or whatever you may use, um, and cereal. Those are all goods. Those are all tangible th things. So if we understand what the difference between goods versus services are, what we need to next identify is the difference between consumer goods and industrial goods. Consumer goods are very simply those goods that are for personal use. These are non-industrial products. These are what the general public can buy. You walk into a retail store, you'll find consumer goods. Consumer goods may also, in some cases, be marketed towards industry. However, if they are marketed towards industry and used by industry, then they will fall under the industrial goods section. So just because, I don't know if you look at that picture, the Weetabix cereal, if you find that in a business unit, that will no longer be a consumer good, but will fall under the industrial goods section. Whereas if you go home and you find Weetabix in your own cupboard, well, that's a consumer good. You, as the consumer, purchase that good. Now, industrial goods fall under one of three categories. It, either they will be raw materials, or processed goods, or finished goods. Raw materials are those items that have been extracted from the earth. Logging, fishing oil rigs, those are all raw materials. We've extracted them from the earth to be used in our businesses. These raw materials are needed to make a lot of goods that we find um, in everyday use. A lot of raw materials are exported when, we, when we're looking at raw materials in Canada. Canada is famous for its raw materials. Why? Because we have such a huge, huge land filled with all sorts of raw materials. So the world will come to us for their raw materials. We're lucky in that respect and we earn a lot of money in this way. And so Canadian businesses are very successful if they are those businesses that are extracting the raw materials. Processed goods are slightly different. Processed goods, although they may look like they are in the raw material state, are processed raw materials. They have to be processed before they can be used in the business units. So if you look at the, the sequence of pictures there, you'll see the first one raw materials and you'll see the logging truck. Well, that's, Those logs are the raw materials. 
Under processed goods, you'll see the pile of what looks like sawdust or wood chips. That's pulp or wood pulp, and that wood pulp is then pro processed into a finished product. So it goes from logs to wood pulp, which is the processing. It alters the nature of the product. So pressing apples into apple juice or pasteurizing and homogenizing milk, that's all processing of raw materials. The processed goods can be sold as finished goods or semi-finished goods. In some cases, processed goods are what, we, what other businesses buy or that might be their finished state. And in some cases, logs that are cut into two-by-fours are sold to consumers. So you have to recognize the fact that some goods, although they might seem industrial, could be consumer. It depends on who is buying them. And although some goods may seem like they're not finished, may be finished for some people and therefore are finished processed goods. And lastly, we have finished goods. These finished goods are the eventual product that has been extracted from the earth, processed, and then has been completed to form some sort of product that industry will use. I use a picture of toilet paper there. I know that may seem foul or smelly. Uh, but really the idea here is that we extract logs from the earth, we process it into wood pulp, and then that wood pulp is then made into a finished good, which is toilet paper. And I use toilet paper as well because of the idea that industrial goods may seem like consumer goods, but if they're used in industry, they are therefore industrial goods. If you walk around the school, I guarantee you will find toilet paper in any of the washrooms. At least I hope you will. Uh, however, if you go home and you find a piece of toilet paper, that toilet paper all of a sudden has become a consumer good. So again, the difference between consumer and industrial goods is where it's being used. If it's at your house, you as a consumer, it is therefore a consumer good. If it is in a business unit, a corporation, it is therefore an industrial good. So, we've looked at goods. What's the difference between goods and services? Well, it all comes down to the, that tangible asset. If it's not tangible, if someone is providing a service, it there, is there for a service. But what is a consumer service versus an industrial service? If you look at the picture, I've included the Mississauga Grand Banquet Hall. Many of you, I'm sure, have attended here for some sort of wedding or event with your family or friends. Whereas in other cases, people who are working for corporations will go there and have training sessions. I have attended the Mississauga Grand Banquet Hall for professional development, uh, for teaching. So when does Mississauga Grand fall under a consumer service versus when it, does it fall under an industrial service? And again, it depends on the use. If the use is for consumers, so for weddings or you know, birthday parties or whatever it may be, that is a consumer service. Or the Miss uh, Grand, I should say, is offering a consumer service. If they are renting out the hall to industry, to businesses, to the school, to the appeal board itself, it is therefore an industrial service. Or, I should say again, providing an industrial service. So services, again, consumer versus industrial, all depends on who is using it or what it's being offered for. Next, we're going to move on to organizational structures. Now that we've identified different types of goods and services, we need to identify how businesses organize themselves. There are four ways that businesses really can organize themselves. It'll either fall under regional, international, brand, or distribution. A regional organization can fall within a city, or a region, or a group of provinces. This regional structure allows a company to respond quickly to regional differences. I mean, many of you think that everyone in Canada is the same, but I hope what you realize is that Canadians differ based on their region. If you go to, or have ever been to Newfoundland, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. Newfoundlanders are far different from people who live in Ontario, and therefore they purchase goods and services that are far different from what we purchase here in Ontario. International. This is an organizational structure that sets up marketing and distribution centers in foreign markets, so in foreign countries. So a Canadian firm, we'll use Research in Motion for example, has a corporate head office here in Waterloo, Ontario. However, they also have offices around the world. 
and each of those offices would be focused on that nation or that region of the world. And this is an international structure. This international structure allows for marketing to be done and distribution to be done in foreign markets. And again, just like the regional structure, it caters more effectively to those local markets. Buying habits, customs, interests, language, all these are different around the world. And companies need to respond to these differences. A campaign that may appeal to an Indian market may not be so successful in a Canadian market and vice versa. A campaign that is catered towards the European market may not cater itself well to the American market and international structures therefore allow for this difference. Brand structures is the most common method of organizing marketing activity, especially for those companies that sell a wide variety of products. Procter & Gamble, for instance, Kellogg's, Campbell's, Pepperidge Farm, V8, Prego, all these are brands within this unit. And these companies have all these different brands that need people to look after them 100% of the time. This diversity in their products and markets allows for one or more of the company's major brands to become that focus. They can focus on the specific brand more effectively, make marketing decisions more effectively, make promotional decisions more effectively, make advertising more specific to that brand. And therefore, the brand structure allows for marketers to focus specifically on those brands. Lastly, we have the distribution method of organizational structures. And this is where the marketing activities are distributed around the ways that the product or service will be delivered to the customer. In some ways, distribution is done through restaurants. In other ways, it might be through retail stores. In other ways, through vending machines like we have in the school. And so if you organize your your company around these distribution methods, you can focus again on those distribution channels. Some distribu distribution channels, I should say, are very easy to manage. Others are require a little bit more work or more complicated. And so if you have these complicated distribution channels, maybe it's appropriate to organize your corporation in such a way. So, now that we've talked about regional, international, brand, and distribution, let's take a look at each. The regional structure. This is used by many companies here in Canada. Coca-Cola Corporation of Canada is a has a regional structure. They will focus their efforts in each of the different regions of Canada. British Columbia, the Prairie Provinces, Ontario, Quebec, and the East Coast. You'll notice a lot of times that markets that are very large will have their own branch of this regional structure, whereas smaller markets may be composed of a number of provinces. The Quebec market, we can understand, would have its own regional structure due to the language differences. The Ontario market would have its own regional structure because of the size of the market. The Greater Toronto area in itself is one-third, roughly, the size of Canada. That requires a huge effort to be made to distributing in that market. British Columbia, which has Vancouver, is also a large market and therefore would have its own regional structure. Whereas the Prairie Provinces and the East Coast, those are smaller provinces and therefore you could combine those together to focus on. The international structure is one thing that we see about major international brands and companies and the McDonald's Corporation is no different. McDonald's Corporation would organize itself along continental lines in a lot of cases. So South America, Asia Pacific, North America, Europe, and Africa. It could also break down from there and we find that the North American structure of, or the North American branch of the international structure would focus on Canada versus the United States. Canada and the United States, although we share the same continent, is, are far different. And so the international structure would allow for McDonald's to focus on these markets more effectively and more specifically. The brand structure. This is because companies, certain companies again, have these great variety of brands and products. And Pepsi Company, or Pepsi Bottling Company, I should say, is no different. If you look at Pepsi Company structure, we have Pepsi, then we have Frito-Lay, then we have Tropicana, then we have Quaker, then we have Gatorade. These are all PepsiCo products. And from there, it breaks down into even further brands. So we have Pepsi, then Diet Pepsi, Sierra, Ocean Spray, Mountain Dew, Amp Energy, Mug Root Beer, Sobe, Aquafina, Brisk, and it keep, actually keeps going. 
Frito Lay is, is similar. You have Lay's and Doritos and Ruffles and Sun Chips and Roll Gold and Cracker Jack and Cheetos and Fritos and Hickory Sticks. And again, it just kind of keeps going. And Tropicana, Quaker, and Gatorade are no different. Look, Gatorade is a little smaller. G Series versus G Series Fit versus G Series Pro. Sounds kind of funny. If you're fit, apparently you can't drink the Pro. If you're a professional, you can't take, drink the Fit or the Series. But this is a way that you can organize your, your, your company based on your brands. Then we have our distribution structure. In Maxwell House, I use it as an example here. Maxwell House, you can find in many restaurants and retail stores and hotels and vending machines and airlines. And therefore, they would organize themselves based on this distribution structure. They would have a sales team or a marketing team in charge of just maintaining relationships with restaurants. Whereas they would have another part of their business unit focused on how do we get Maxwell House into vending machines all around the world. Another part of their business would be focused on the airlines. A lot of people who fly drink coffee. And the hotels, same idea. And then we have the retail store section of the distribution structure. So Maxwell House more effectively can cater their products to those branches of their organizational structure. That's it for today. Hopefully you have gathered all the notes. Again, remember to replay, rewatch, rewind if needed. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow.